Good morning, good afternoon, or maybe even good night, ladies and gentlemen, from all over the world. My name is Eleanor van Gerven, and I'm a member of the Executive Committee of the World Council. How good it is to notice that so many of you have been able to join us at the second day of our World Council for Gifted and Talented Children biannual conference. This year, our conference is different for each and every one of us compared to all our previous conferences. The pandemic forced the Executive Committee to choose for an online setting. I know we all miss each other in real life, meeting each other in real life, having the opportunity to recharge our batteries with our own tribe. However, I think Tyler Clark and his crew have accomplished a great job in setting up the platform, aiming for as much interaction as realistically possible. As contributors to our programme, you do all a wonderful job in sharing your knowledge and expertise, and in doing so, our professional community sticks together until we can meet again. For now, I would like to give a special welcome to Professor Dr. Anouk Bax. Anouk started her career as a teacher. Later, she studied psychology and got involved in teacher education. Currently, Anouk is Professor of Giftedness at Radboud University. She is also Associate Professor at Fontes University of Applied Sciences, where she is a teacher educator and an academic director of the Academic Educational Programme for Teachers. Her area of expertise is teachers' professional education, and she is um, uh, for the field of gifted education. She is the initiator of Educational Field Labs on Gifted Education and co-founder of the Scientific Center of Expertise Ratio, Radboud Talent in Development. Anouk wrote several books and articles on gifted education, and I am proud to tell you that last year we worked together on a new publication about school policy for gifted education in primary and secondary schools, which is about to be launched in exactly a week from now. Anouk's work reflects a broad perspective not only on gifted education, but on education in general. She encourages teachers to embrace their natural curiosity and transfer this into an investigated attitude that benefits lifelong professional learning and development. Today, Anouk will be talking about POINT, the educational field lab she initiated. And she will tell you about how POINT programs are able to bridge the gap between educational science and educational practice. In the POINT programme, researchers and teachers unite their forces and explore systematically how they can improve gifted education based on the inclusive approach that the Dutch government requires for education in general. In the POINT programme, the, the POINT programme proves to be very successful. Both researchers and teachers who join the programme are enthusiastic about their work and their results. The POINT programme started out as a single field lab but now the programme is being duplicated in other school districts as well. But if, before I spoil all the fun, I will give the floor to Professor Anouk Box. Feel free to give her a big virtual hand in our chat box. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for this special introduction. Hello, everybody, and it's great to see you here online. Good morning or good afternoon, or maybe even a good night. For some of you, it's, uh, it's the middle of the night. I would like to thank the committee of this World Conference for the opportunity to share our good practice and our newest studies with you. I'm honored to do so. And before I start my presentation, I would like to express a special thank you to Tyler Clark. Thank you, Tyler, for all the support. Thank you so much. I am Anouk Bax, and I come from the Netherlands. And as you can see, this is a very small country in the west of Europe. Well, maybe you already know the Netherlands. From the water and the ice skating, they are in winters, are wooden shoes, but no one uh, actually uh, wears them uh, every day anymore. The famous Dutch cheeses like Gouda or Edammer, and of course, our bikes. Every man, woman and child cycles and has one or more bikes. We have beautiful tulips in the fields and our stroopwafels. Ah, I see my screen isn't fully yet. I'm going to give it a try again. Is it now? Could someone give me some information on that, please? Eleanor, is it shared now? 
No. I'm sorry, then we're going to try it again. Yes, sharing it again, and it will just start over. So I think you'd like to see the nice pictures from the Netherlands. So now it's coming up. Eleanor, do you see it now? No, how is that possible? Um, with me, it says it's on. Oh, she says, yes. I'm sorry for that, people. We just start over again. This is the Netherlands, and we are in, in the west of Europe, as I said. And there are the beautiful pictures from the Netherlands. Well, maybe you know us from, uh, from the rivers and the ice skating in winters, the wooden shoes and our cheeses, and maybe from, from uh, the bikes, because every man, woman, and child cycles in the Netherlands. We all have uh, bikes, one or two. And we have beautiful tulips in the fields, and of course, our stroopwafels. And when I was in uh, Nashville two years ago, at this world conference, I could even get a stroopwafel McFlurry over there. And in the Netherlands, we also have gifted learners. And it's not always easy to offer every child tailored education. And this seems especially hard for gifted learners. In the Netherlands, most teachers are very skilled in addressing special needs for students who might get behind a little. But it seems harder to support our gifted students in what they need for optimal development. And unfortunately, this isn't new. But what is new is the educational field lab we started five years ago. And I would love to tell you more about this field lab and show you how we started bridging the gap between theory and practice. In order to do so, I prepared three parts. The first part is on our educational field labs. The second part, I will give you an example of one of our latest scientific studies. And in the final part, I'll tell you something about the teacher research. And this brings us to the first part. Point. Our field lab is called Point, and that is an abbreviation for adequate or tailored education for each new talent. And by talent, we mean cognitive talent. It's about five years ago that we started our research field lab Point. The Point Lab is a close collaboration between three types of organizations, primary schools, research universities, and teacher education institutes. In our lab, teachers, scientists, master students, and teacher educators work together on research regarding gifted education. You can see how many people are involved in one field lab. Amongst others, this field lab can be seen as a form of teacher education. Field labs like ours enable professional learning for teachers. It embodies continuous professionalization, striving for lifelong learning. We want teachers to embrace learning and not only for their gifted students, also for themselves. And participating in a field lab like point helps to enable teachers to improve their practice for gifted education. And here you see some of us. We found one another in the passion and interest we share for gifted learners. We all want to improve education for gifted learners and working together gives us the best chance to do so. And here you see Lisa. She started four years ago as a master student in one of the field labs. And now she works there as a junior researcher and a coordinator. She likes to tell you a bit more about the lab. Nick, would you be so kind to start the first video? Elise, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Elise Samse. Three years ago, I had a unique opportunity to write my master thesis in the Educational Research Lab Points. 
I think the great thing about POINT is that it bridges the gap between science and practice. The collaboration between the various disciplines make POINT an inspiring place to conduct research. And this is one of the reasons why I still work at POINT, but now as a junior researcher. In this short video, I would like to tell you more about POINT. Well, POINT is an educational research lab related to giftedness and cognitive talent. Our main goal is to improve education for all children, including the gifted. In POINT, teachers, teacher educators, researchers and students work together on educational research. A problem or question from educational practice is the starting point for all our studies. The results and insights from our studies are always shared with educational practice, regionally in our schools, but also nationally and internationally. For example, we write practical articles, scientific articles, and we make short informative video clips. Our wonderful collaboration between science and practice has a positive impact in both fields. For example, researchers learn to work in a practice sensitive way and teachers learn research skills and develop an investigative approach. And last but not least, the children also benefit from points because their teachers apply the insights from our studies in their classrooms. I hope this video has given you an impression of our educational research lab and I wish you a good conference. Goodbye! Thank you. Yes, great. In our lab, we try to involve young potentials like Elisa, next to more senior colleagues. And you will see more of our colleagues coming up soon. The main aim of our research lab is to realize more adequate or tailored education for all students, including the gifted ones. And we do that by doing research together and by sharing research findings from international studies. We do this by shaping a sustainable professional learning community in which teachers, teacher educators and researchers work together on teams that are in line with tailored education for gifted pupils. Next, we strive to knowledge development and knowledge sharing by teachers, teacher educators and researchers on the team of giftedness. And third, the development of a research oriented attitude and capacity among the part participating point teachers. And also we aim at the development of a more practice sensitive attitude among the participating point researchers. And I think that the timing was right for a lab like ours. Because from studies, we knew that gifted Dutch pupils do not achieve the excellent results that they could and they do not perform up to their full potential. Also, we saw that Dutch teachers had more attention for special needs pupils instead of the gifted pupils, and that teachers had some difficulties in teaching gifted students. Additionally, compared to the students of surrounding countries, Dutch students seem to have motivational problems with school, and also our gifted students. And new insights were needed in order for school leaders and teacher teams to be able to make evidence-informed decisions about practice and a close collaboration between scientists, teachers and teacher educators could make this happen. Well, back at the start, five years ago, the Dutch government funded three research labs in the Netherlands for three years. Our lab was the only one with the topic of educating gifted learners. You might understand that many school teams, researchers and teacher educators were interested in joining the research lab. Also because all hours invested there were paid for. And we started with 11 schools, three research universities and one teacher training institute. And after these three years, there was no financial funding anymore. However, the outcomes and professionalization of all participants were so positive that we continued our lab. 
The school teams now pay for the coordination of the educational field lab and all participants invest their time in the lab. And in September coming up, we will have three labs with 34 schools, three research universities and the largest teacher training institute of the Netherlands. Every participating school receive, receives this. This is a framed poster or picture, and it's actually quite big. And they put it up, the, in, up to the wall in the schools, and then everyone can see that they are part of the field lab and what we are going to do in the field labs. And they are ready to go. And what does that mean, ready to go? Well, more concrete, in our field labs, all participants join for a cycle of three years. We have eight meetings each year and all meetings are an entire day. In these meetings, we work on team building or community building to become a real group with a joint mission. Teachers share their good practices from what works in their classes and why they are so positive about that specific practice. And we see in the upcoming next weeks that the other teachers also try out these practices in their own classes. We also have time for exchange, for example, on complex cases within the schools. And in the lab, the expertise and experiences with same like cases is shared. Each meeting, we have an inspiring presentation by an expert from science or practice. And we talk about these presentations together and also like to ask triggering or critical questions to one another as part of the inquisitive attitude. During the meetings and in between meetings, we work on research together. We distinguish two types of research, large scale studies, done by scientists and small scale studies done by teachers. And I'll go into that a bit more coming up soon. In between meetings, teachers and scientists or teacher educators meet in smaller groups for the supervision and support of the small scale teacher research. Scientists and teacher educators visit the schools and support the teachers with their study. Knowledge development is something we do together. For example, we write papers or practice-based articles. We give workshops and lectures. And together, we also educate our future teachers, the teacher students. The teacher education is done together. So one day a year, the teachers, scientists and teacher educators from the lab share their knowledge on educating gifted learners with teacher students because they become our future teachers. And this is part of the teacher education curriculum. It's obligatory, so all students participate. And over more than 200 teacher students each year participate in this. And I'll come to uh, the product development uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. I hope with this, you have some first impressions on how we work in the field labs. In the second part, I would like to give you an example of one of our latest studies. But before doing so, I would like to introduce Sven to you. Sven is a scientist and he likes to tell you what is in it for scientists to join a lab like ours. Would you please be so kind to start video two, Sven. Hello. I am Sven Matthijsen and I'm the Vice Program Director of the Rapout International Training on High Ability. And I'm also the Editor-in-Chief for Journal Talent, which is a popular scientific journal about giftedness in the Netherlands. And I'm also a researcher within POINT and I'm very happy to be part of POINT because it taught me so much. Uh, my background is psychology, so I learned from the books how it can go in education and what questions to ask if you want to research or study educational fields. And when I got involved in POINT, I collaborated with teachers and I noticed a lab setting or a research setting is in the classroom. And the questions I would want to see answered aren't always the questions that teachers have. 
So by collaborating, we came to questions we both wanted to see answered. And that is how the gap between science and practice can be closed. And we can merge the two worlds that shouldn't be separate worlds in the first place. But now that they are, we should start closing it again. And this collaboration is so fruitful and so insightful for the field of giftedness and also outside of that field, it really contributes to understanding the world better by collaborating together and by getting to uh, by getting as close as we can get to the truth. So I hope uh, that more researchers are willing and are encouraged to be part of a research lab such as Point and are willing to collaborate with people in the field um, in order to get as close to the truth as possible. Thank you. What's very nice to see is the way that scientists in our labs become more practice oriented and sensitive for what's important for the field of gifted education. Another advantage for scientists is the possibility to collect data within the schools because all schools are open for studies and data collection. And I will let you get into the secret into how this works. Each year in each lab, a large scale study is conducted. In most of our studies, more than 1000 students participate, but sometimes we have smaller studies. Coming up, I'll give you an example of one, one of our a bit smaller studies because it's a, it's a qualitative one, but very interesting, I think. It, and it's dependent on the questions schools have because that is where the adventure starts, in the schools. As you can see, the first step is asking the teachers what we can do for them by means of research. The teachers take this question back to their schools and consult the team the school leader and the administration. The next meeting, they come back with one or two, sometimes even three or four topics or problems or questions within the schools they would like to get more understanding of. And that day, we exchange the topics the teachers come up with. And scientists reflect on these topics, sharing knowledge and studies that are already done in these fields and finding gaps in knowledge. And then we search for one joint theme or topic for all the schools together. And all schools can commit to one large study for that year. Some of the topics that were not chosen, for example, because they were too context specific for one particular school, can be used for the small scale studies the teachers do themselves. And then scientists propose a research question or a set of research questions. And when we all agree on this, scientists set up the design of the study, look for instruments and so on. But during this process, teachers are consulted to make sure that we stay on the right track. Most of the times, master students are involved in this process. And they also experience working in the lab as inspiring showing them how science can really help improving practice. And all steps in a study are exchanged with all participants. The teachers and master students conduct the studies, which are supported by the teachers. And in the last step, knowledge is shared with others by all of us. And this brings me to an example. From the schools, there were questions about their gifted students and how, besides their cognitive talent, they were different from other students. The teachers were curious. How do the gifted students perceive themselves? What kind of characteristics do they uh, use when they describe themselves? And does this differ from other students or other learners? They wanted to know more about this because it might help them to improve their practice a bit more because of a deeper understanding of the students they work with. With our field labs, we want to improve education for gifted learners. And instead of scientists and teacher educators telling the teachers what to do, 
we collaborate with teachers. And this gives, this helps giving the teachers ownership of the research and making the studies valuable for practice. And in the same way, in this study, we involve the gifted learners and their classmates, giving them a voice. And this is an example of a large scale study. Well, actually it's a little smaller because of the qualitative uh, character of the study. And each year we conduct one and sometimes two large scale studies in each field lab. Scientists and teacher educators conduct the large scale studies and a teacher support it and coordinate the studies within their schools. And often the students, teachers and junior researchers help with data collection. We looked into descriptions on self-concept and here you can see the one we used in our study. We define self-concept as the beliefs that an individual holds about him or herself, the set of features that each person uses to define him or herself as an individual and to differentiate him or herself from other people. Maybe you know this already, or maybe this is uh, new for you, but from literature, it's known that the representation of the self grows and deepens when children grow older. In general, this deepening process of the self and being able to describe oneself can be summarized as follows. From about nine months old, pre-representational forms of self-awareness, differentiation between the self and others exist. Between 15 and 18 months, self-recognition in the mirror uh, gets up and showing self-reference emotions. Between about two and three years old, verbal expression, reflecting internal experiences. Between three and four years old, self-descriptions as behavioral and observable characteristics can be watched, but mostly they are unrealistically positive which can be nice, of course. Between five and eight years old, cognitive advances, categorization of behaviors and characteristics referring to the selves are seen, including opposites, for example, positive and negative emotions, but still rather unrealistically positive. From eight years old, a more objective and realistic self-concept exists. And between about 8 and 12 years old, descriptions exist in terms of personality characteristics, competences, and interpersonal characteristics. We also see then more higher order generalizations. Well, this is known in general, and it's interesting to see whether there are differences between the gifted learners and their classmates when they describe themselves. While the self-concept of gifted learners might be influenced by their cognitive talent, but there is more. We know that gifted learners are a minority group in schools because this is a rather small group in regular schools. And gifted learners might be approached differently by people in their environment because of certain misconceptions. For example, that they don't need instruction or support when deploying learning activities. There are not many studies on self-concept of young gifted learners, and this especially goes from studies from the perspective of students' voice using open exploratory instruments. And here you can see the research questions we addressed. We looked at which categories of self-descriptions are mentioned by primary school pupils and are there differences in reported descriptions of self-concepts of gifted and other pupils? And second, which specific age-related and gender differences are reported in the self-descriptions of gifted pupils compared to other pupils? Well, I already talked a bit about the design and here you can see it summarized. We conducted a qualitative study using pupils' voice. It was an open study and we compared the two groups of students. In total, 293 pupils participated from eight different schools. The ages varied between 15 and 13 years old, and 46 of the pupils uh, were female. 
And of the total group, 45% of them uh, were gifted. This is the instrument we used. We helped the students by reading out loud the three questions you see here. We asked them, who am I? Or who are you? What are my characteristics? What do I like to do? What can I do well? And what can't I do well? And well, we call this the who am I spider. But the students corrected us. Well, as you know, these kids are quite perceptive. So they told us that a spider doesn't have 10 legs. It has many, many eyes. So this wasn't a spider at all. And of course, they were right. So we asked them how to call it. And together we came up with mind map. And that worked. So we use mind map for the students. And I'll stick to the who am I spider for today. Here you see an example of an who am I spider. This is one from a 12 years old boy. As you can see, he mentioned quite a lot. And he also likes to draw and use colors. The upper one in the left corner is interesting. It states that when he was younger, he got angry quite easily. And when you take a bit a closer look, you can see the angry eyes and eyebrows emphasizing what he states over there. And for the Dutch colleagues, it may be visible. This boy makes quite some mistakes in Dutch language. And I love this spider as an example for my teacher students, because often they don't understand how it's possible that a gifted student, like the one who completed this spider, can make so many mistakes. And from there, we can start talking about twice exceptional learners, and so on. Well, as you can see, all spiders have their own stories. Well, let's go back on track. You can understand that it was a great joy to analyze all these Who Am I Spiders. In total, we found 11 categories of characteristics, like personal characteristics, leisure activities, family and social contacts, and looks. The gifted learners refer to personal characteristics and skills the most, followed by sports and school or scholastic skills. The other learners refer to sports the most, followed by personal characteristics and leisure activities. Let's go into this a bit more in detail. As you can see, the gifted pupils mentioned intelligence and intelligence-related characteristics more than the other students did. They referred to themselves as being smart, intelligent, gifted, highly gifted, or smarter than other kids. Both groups uh, refer to themselves as being cooperative, social, or helpful. The other pupils mentioned more than the gifted ones did, that they sometimes had difficulties with attention. The gifted pupils mentioned more about honesty, and that was in two ways. They referred to themselves as being honest, but also that they um, uh, appreciated honesty as a virtue quite a lot. The gifted pupils referred to themselves more as being open-minded than the other pupils did, and the other pupils between the age of 8 and 10 years old mentioned more positively related characteristics than the gifted pupils did. And the last one, the gifted pupils came up more uh, describing themselves as being perfectionistic than the other pupils did. And it seemed that the gifted students didn't like sports as much as the other students did. The other students uh, refer to themselves more as being part of team sports, doing individual sports, and being sportive. And only gifted pupils, only five of them, mentioned disliking sports a lot. Looking into school and scholastic skills, 
The gifted pupils mentioned more positively related aspects about school, but also negatively related aspects, like they didn't like um, going to school or they had difficulties reading because of dyslexia. Conclusion. We gained more understanding of the characteristics of the self-concept of gifted pupils and other students. We found some different categories and we found differences between the personal characteristics and the sports mentions. The gifted students mentioned more in all characteristics. They gave more uh, answers into the spider. And the other students mentioned more about family relations and social contacts. In conclusion, giftedness might influence the way children see and experience and express themselves, and this varies per domain. The development of the self-concept seemed to be a bit earlier for the gifted learners. In this study, we found indications of an advanced cognitive development that seems to be already present in self-descriptions from the age of five as well as indications of an increased awareness of inner experiences. We didn't only gain some insights, we also gained a better understanding of how gifted learners view themselves and how this differs from other learners. And this we wanted to share with educational practitioners inside and outside our field labs. And we did the following. We wrote uh, papers and fact sheets about it. We um, introduced this study into a handbook for teacher students. We made small video clips about it. And the Who Am I Spider is used in, in many classes already for all students, including the gifted ones. And this brings us already to the third and last part of our presentation, the teacher research. One of our teachers who works with gifted students was willing to tell you something about her experiences in our field lab. Here you can see Linda. Nick, would you show the video for Linda, please? Hello, my name is Linda van Elderen and I'm a teacher researcher at the Educational Research Lab Point for six years now. My participation in Point has meant a lot to my practice and my own development. Because I'm constantly being fed with scientific insights, I'm able to look critically at my own actions and my own practice and make adjustments when necessary. The constant interaction between science and practice is very valuable to me. Through my participation in POINT, I have discovered that I want to develop myself in doing practical research. I experience that it's very valuable to link my practical experience and the scientific knowledge I'm gaining in order to constantly improve my own teaching practice. I'm very happy that I have had the opportunity to participate in POINT and would give every teacher this opportunity. Yes, thank you for Linda. The teachers conduct one study during the three year cycle in the field lab. And their studies originate from a context-based problem addressing a local question or problem and the goal is that teachers learn more about gifted education and that they become teacher researchers. They learn how to design and conduct research, they develop an inquisitive attitude, and they initiative or they initiate or improve a research-oriented culture within their schools. The teacher conducts the research and is supported by a scientist or a teacher educator. In the three years, in this cycle, teachers design their study in the first year, they conduct it in the second year, and they share their findings by means of product development in the third year. And those three phases are cut into smaller steps, as you can see over here. And this brings us to an example of a study one of our teachers started this year. Hanneke wanted to work on identification of gifted learners within her school because the problem was that her colleagues thought there were hardly any gifted students in the school because they didn't know where to look for. Hanneke started reading about identification and characteristics of giftedness and she was supported by this by a teacher educator. The practical relevance was quite clear for Hanneke 
And after having read about the topic, she found that there was also scientific relevance of her studies. And she formulated the relevance of her studies as follows. Teachers from the school say they don't have enough knowledge and skills to identify and guide gifted learners. And from theory, she learned that late identification can lead to a mismatch between educational needs and potential and learning environment, which might lead to problems of all kinds. This made it even more important to conduct the study. The aim of our study was to improve teachers' knowledge on the characteristics of gifted students so they can identify gifted students as early as possible. But as part of the study, she also wanted to see whether her approach worked. Together with a teacher educator and a scientist, Hanneke formulated the following questions. To what extent does a one-time professional development activity contribute to knowledge about gifted students so that teachers can identify gifted students? She also made up two sub-questions. What characteristics of gifted students do teachers mention prior and after the professionalization activity? And second, what do teachers still need? after the professionalization activity in order to be really able to identify the gifted students in their class. She designed a pre-test intervention post-test study in which the entire school team would be involved. She wanted to use a word spider or a mind map, a simple mind map in which one open question would be asked, what are the characteristics of a gifted child? Her intervention would be a professionalization activity with the entire team. After that, she would repeat the word spider, but she would also uh, hold some semi-structured interviews with each individual colleague, asking them what they would need for their professional needs. She also formulated some expectation. She wanted a knowledge game, of teachers concerning characteristics of gifted students, and she wanted more insights in the needs of teachers concerning identification of the gifted students in their school after the professionalization intervention. So the appropriate subsequent steps could be taken within her own schools. Well, all teachers design their own study during the first year and make a poster like this one you see on the left side, and this poster is presented within the field labs and within the school teams. In the second year, the teachers conduct their studies. And in the third year, knowledge is shared and products are developed. Here you can see what teachers do to share their knowledge within and outside of their school teams. Of course, they share the knowledge in the lab and in their team, but they also write practical articles shared with many, many teachers. Last articles were shared with 35,000 Dutch teachers. They help us with educating teacher students and they work on product development. Now, to be honest, the theme of identification comes up each year in a new field lab. So this wasn't a new topic for us. And it makes you wonder why. Because one can read about characteristics, models and theories about giftedness. But this isn't always sufficient to really involve people or to help people feel competent. The teacher studies that are conducted in the lab over and over again can help scientists to gain more understanding of practice. And this, in turn, can contribute towards theory building. Well, in the first field lab in the third year, we developed a product that helps teachers learn about identification of gifted learners. I would like to conclude this presentation by showing you this product. It brings us to the very last part, an example of a practical application in which science and practice come together in a product we developed. Here you can see a game called Enigma. It's a serious game for teachers, educational professionals and student teachers. And it's a game box with different parts in it. And one part is on identification. The game was developed by the point participants from the lab, and it's an interplay of science and practice. Everything in it 
is evidence informed. And real cases of students have been used, which were written by the teachers. Within our multidisciplinary team, all different talents and knowledge of the team members have been used. Well, we choose a serious game as a product because we notice that all the written outputs like the books, papers or articles for practice do not always reach all teachers. So we search for more effective ways to reach teachers as an addition to what we already did. We acquired input from teachers and researchers in meetings and we reviewed literature on teacher professional professionalization and serious games. We came up with four design principles. You can see them here below. Design features, active learning, knowledge gain, and it should be recognizable. Because we only have uh, a little time left, I'll tell you a bit more about the first and the third design principle. Our first design principle was on design features. In the left column, you see what the practitioners thought would be important. In the middle column, you see what we learned from scientists and literature. And in the right column, you see how we use this input in the development of the game. On the left, you see the teachers wanted a real game, not an online tool. It shouldn't be too complex. It should have game elements to make it fun. And it should have a good quality. From scientists and literature, we saw real games are more effective and games can stimulate motivation and openness to learning. Well, how did we use this input into the game Enigma? We made a compact board game, clear and simple instruction manual and instruction videos for the ones that don't like reading. We included a game element, fact or fable, and we had it make uh, produced by a publishing house. So we didn't do it uh, ourselves because, because well, that, that's not our specialty, of course. The third design principle was about a knowledge game. Here you see in the left side, the teachers wanted it to be evidence informed. Misconceptions should be addressed, but also a behavioral component should be in it. And we used it in the game. I have to, uh, to make an end to our story. So it's coming up. Here you can see our teacher students playing the game. As you can see, we made a game night out of it with nice drinks and snacks. And they really liked it. And they also learned a lot about it. Working in a field lab like ours, from a close collaboration between scientists, teachers, and teacher educators is how we connect theory to practice. I hope you saw that everyone in our field labs can be him or herself, and that everyone's input is highly appreciated. We start from people's curiosity, because we all are curious and inquisitive. But in the Netherlands, in schools, so many standardized methods and materials in class are used that we sometimes forget to be curious again. In the field lab, all participants, teachers, scientists and teacher educators systematically explore reality. And it helps us bridging the gap between science and education and improving educational practice for all learners, including the gifted ones. I hope this presentation inspired you to start your own field labs. And of course, I will be happy to help you. So please feel welcome to contact me anytime. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you Anouk um, um, for a wonderful presentation. Um, and I noticed in the chat that we had very enthusiastic reactions, but we also had a couple of questions. And I we just have very limited time, so I tried to pick out some of the questions that might ignite um, um, some more discussion later on for people and might uh, encourage them to contact you. Um, at the very early start, there was a question by Melinda Gindy, and she said, I would be very interesting to know how you used the research to obtain the initial funding. Was the research alone enough for the government to recognize 
that reform was needed for Dutch, Dutch gifted learners or were there catalysts that bridged the initial research uh, and the initial funding? So again, um, how is research used to obtain the initial funding? Um, yes, thank you for this very interesting uh, question, Eleanor. Um, yes, research was used uh, indeed to make uh, a strong application for the funding. Uh, in total, um, I think 19 or 20 uh, uh, groups uh, wanted to get the funding and only three of them uh, actually received the funding. We could make a strong case uh, for the gifted learners and the need of uh, change, uh, well, I would almost say our educational systems, uh, because up till now we are not fully able uh, yet to give them uh, what they need, uh, addressing their educational needs and helping them to uh, receive their full potential. And studies showing that uh, helped us uh, receive uh, the fundings. Okay, thank you, Anouk. Um, and I'm just scrolling through the questions. Um, uh, um, um, so prior asked the question, how has it changed the research into the university? Yes, that's, uh, that's a very nice one. Because, uh, well, within uh, the universities of applied uh, sciences, uh, actually all results from the field lab and all participants are used to, uh, to improve our uh, education for the teacher students. But within the research universities, I think uh, most gained out of it is uh, the more practice-based way of doing uh, research and collaboration uh, with the teachers. And, it's really nice for the scientists participating in, in our field lab um, that they, they see how valuable their um, studies and outcome of the studies is. I think most of all, giving meaning to the work of the scientists is highly appreciated and that makes uh, scientists uh, applying for a role in our uh, field labs. Okay, thank you, Anouk. Um, Daniela Cassetta asked the question, did you have your gifted students already identified in your school or had you to identify them as well in the study? Um, that's the study about the self-concept, I suppose. Yeah, I, yeah yes. that, that was about that. Yes. The um, these students already had been identified in different ways. Some of the schools in the Netherlands stopped using uh, IQ assessments and they uh, identify by means of uh, teachers observing them using instruments. Sometimes parents uh, go to school and ask questions about could it be uh, possible and uh, the, the pupils who participated in our study were pupils who uh, all uh, were into uh, pull-out programs. So that's how we uh, got to these uh, large groups of uh, gifted students. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have time for two more questions. Mugiatri um, Falisovan um, said, interesting, very inspiring to see the open-minded collaboration. I'm curious to understand if the research also translated to any programs or interventions being implemented by the team for the students. And I think you partly um, answered that question by showing the game, um, but maybe have some more information um, for them. Um, Yes, students like being teacher students or students like being uh, pupils in the school? Uh, that was not, um, I, I could not determine that from the question, but I think um, uh, um, for the pupils in the school. Yes, because for the teacher students, of course, we use the game, but we also have uh, uh, prof professionalization uh, activities. For um, the pupils, we see it in, in different ways. Most, uh, most of the time, the, the small-scale studies uh, done by teachers um, are um, aimed at improving uh, educational practice for the gifted learners. So they try out new materials or new methods and do that in a systematically and methodological valid way and assess whether it works. That's the first uh, phase that's different for all teachers because they can address uh, a problem or question within her, their own uh, groups. Um, but from those outcomes of the small scale studies, we learn all together. So there, uh, the good practices exist. And these good practices are shared with the other teachers and are implemented in the other schools. 
Okay, um, I think a final question um, or a question about the uh, game is, is there uh, a version for secondary education and will there be an English version? Because as far as I can see in the chat, people are really interested in um, an English version. So do you feel challenged, Anouk, for translating the game? Oh, I would be honored to, and I would love to do so. Um, I have it here. As you can see, it's it's a real uh, a real box with cards in it, and everything is uh, is evidence informed. Our students love it, but the teachers also use it as a methodology to uh, oh, it's not the camera to work uh, with the pupils. Um, well, maybe that would something we could do together because we didn't plan making an English one, but I would really love to do so. Yes, and for secondary education, uh, unfortunately. We don't have uh, approval to do that yet because our publishing uh, agent wants to wait a bit longer to see how the first version uh, goes into the schools. I'm happy to collaborate on an English version. Um, 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 I think we have two minutes left, if I'm correct. Um, and I noticed there's a, uh, a very interesting question. Um, and it was about... Um, uh, if there's so many um, research questions um, asked by all the participants, how do you um, um, select which question you would address? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's uh, like a consensus uh, way of doing so. So all parties have to agree that this is important and they want to work on. That's, uh, well, we have... Um, discussion methods for that but what's important is that we don't uh, get into studies that are done already and from schools there exist many questions well we can't answer them entirely but if we can give them the insights that are already uh, there and sometimes questions resolve themselves because they just didn't know so so that's one way some some questions just disappear. And the other way is that all schools have to be able to commit themselves to that question. Because when we um, choose a theme, that's the theme all schools are involved with. And the scientists look for the gaps in, in literature because, of course, they want to use the large data sets for uh, uh, publications. Okay, Anouk, thank you very much. And um, with a quick look at the chat with the producer, I think we are bang on time. Um, it's almost noon. Um, um, thank you for all your efforts. And it was a pleasure working with you today and introducing you to everybody else. Um, everybody who's online now, take a break, take a, a quick sandwich, and uh, please join us for the next live sessions. Um, Thank you very much for joining us.